And I'm there in my room all Sunday morning. 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, got a telephone call. Of course, if I'd have been in the room, I never would have got it. And it said, uh, Dick Jensen is the most popular singer in the islands. He, his wife, him and his wife are spirit-filled now. And his wife called me. She was on the phone. She says, Norval, I'm so glad that I got you to come in. She said, you know, I didn't know you was in town. She said, Dick forgot to tell me. He said he talked to you several days ago, but he forgot, it slipped his mind or something to tell me that you was in town. But she said, I, there, there are some friends here. And she says, when he told me, he told me last night that you was in town. He says, well, I'm going to tell you what happened to me a few days ago. There are two ladies here, a mother and a daughter that's here from Canada. And she was supposed to come over, and the daughter works at a bank in Canada, and she's only 19, she's 19 years old. And she was supposed to come over last January to your convention. And she wanted to come to your convention, but they said she had cancer in her arm. And said, told her not to come. That they wanted to run further test on it. And so that was in January. And she's only 19 years old, works at the bank, and so she just kept on working, but they run tests on it. And they found out that it was messed up on the inside, the cancer had infected on the inside, and they had to take her arm off. So they cut her arm off, just below her shoulder. And she's a very beautiful girl, 19 years old, she's going to get married in August, this coming August, I believe she said. And said, uh, now then, she said, the arm is healed up, but now then, they, they have found cancer in both of her lungs. And there's no hope for her. And she's been listening to your tapes and reading your books in Canada. So I gave that tape series, How to Live and Not Die. She's been listening to it, and she was so hoping that she could see you so you could pray for her. When I found out she was in town, they're telling me all this, so I don't even know you're in town, they're telling me all this. So when they left town, I'll tell you what happened. So when they left, started to leave the house, you know, says, their daddy says, well, you can't ever tell. Honey, I know the doctor said you have cancer in both lungs, there's no hope for you, but you can't ever tell. Uh, I know Jesus could have healed you if we could ever get hold of him in that way, you know, and know the truth and so forth. But she said, you know, God has all kinds of ways of performing miracles. Said sometimes, I hear that Brother Norville, sometimes he goes to Honolulu. Said, you can never tell. God may have him there when you get there. <laughs> and said, would you be willing Oh, well, would you be willing? I said, when are you leaving town? I said, I'm leaving town tomorrow. Oh, my, you are? I said, yeah. Would you be willing to pray for this girl? I said, sure, I'll pray for her. Are you kidding? Well, I mean, can I bring him up there? And I said, yeah. When? I said, right away. I said, I didn't know it, but this is what I've been waiting for. I said, bring her up here. She don't have to die. She can live. And you, lady that has cancer, you don't have to die. You don't have to die. The power of that cancer can be broken. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, through prayer, it can be broken. I'm telling you right now, these five o'clock prayer meetings and praying for an hour or two of a morning will teach you how to pray. You stick with that for a while, and there'll be a power on the inside of you. When you look at cancer, it'll just seem like nothing. In Jesus' name, I break your power. Stop! You die, you dumb cancer. Amen. And that's exactly the way you have to treat it if you want it to die. You can't fool around with it, you know. And play a patty cake with it. You've got to, you've got to deal with cancer like a rattlesnake. You have to let the cancer know exactly where you stand. If you don't let the cancer know how you believe and where you stand, it will not die and it'll keep on spreading. Do you understand that? It won't die and it'll keep on spreading. Jesus spoke to me one time about 15 years ago and told me, he said, 
Some of you probably wonder why I teach like I do. Well, if you had the Lord Jesus Christ to speak to you and tell you something, maybe you'd, you'd do it too. He said, I want you to, 15 years ago, spoke to me one day and says, Son, I want you to start teaching my church how to talk. I said, <laughs> how to talk? I said, people in Boston think I don't know how to talk myself. <laughs> you know, they're from the, from the, the original colonies of the United States. If you live up in there, you know, uh, you're not for sure that people from the South know how to talk. Because they say popcorn and car. <laughs> and, they, and they laugh at your accent if you're from the South. I mean, accent? I mean, you have to stretch your ear to even know what they're saying. <laughs> I said, what do you mean talking about me having an accent? It's not car, it's car, C-A-R. <laughs> I used to date a girl from Boston, you know, and in the days when we'd go to the movies, I'd say, would you like anything? Well, I think, yeah, I think I'd like some popcorn. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> popcorn. I said, what? I don't understand what you said. Popcorn. Oh, I said, you mean popcorn? <laughs> is that what you're saying is popcorn? She said, yeah, that's what I'm saying, popcorn. <laughs> and she'd laugh and say, you're funny, Noel. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? She thought I was funny and I didn't think she could talk. So I said, Jesus, what do you mean me teach people to teach your church how to talk? He said, well, they don't talk enough. They don't know how to talk. Hardly any of them. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they don't talk to cancer. And they don't talk to back trouble. They don't talk to bad blood. And they don't talk to devils. And they don't talk to diseases. He said, I tell you, I told you. I've told the church. They've got it, been had it for 2,000 years. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done for him. But son, my church, they don't talk to mountains. I said, is that right? I want you to talk to them, teach them how to talk to mountains. I said, is that right? Then he put me to a test. He said, have you ever heard a person in your life, any one of my children in church, have you ever heard any person call themselves Christian followers of me? Have you ever heard them openly hold a conversation with the flu? <laughs> I said, no, I never heard anybody hold a conversation with the flu. Did you ever hear somebody sitting in a room in a chair talking to the flu? <laughs> well, what haven't you? Everybody gets it. Nearly. Did you ever hear anybody talking to the, uh, your bad back? Back, I'm talking to you. I command you straighten up. Be strong and straighten out. No, no, I never heard anybody talking to a bad, crooked back. Did you ever hear a cripple talking to a crooked leg? No, I never did do that. No, that's the reason there's still a cripple. If you talk to the mountain, your mountain would be cast to the depths of the sea and gone from you and not bother you anymore. Is that straight? But you have to talk to the mountain. <laughs> and then the Lord told me, he said, they're always wanting to talk to me about their mountains. I said, Jesus, I get them all the time. Hundreds of phone calls wanting to talk to me about their mountains. I get them all the time. He said, you get hundreds, I get millions. <laughs> Is 
He said, I don't want people to talk to me about their problems, about what the devil does for them, and about their mountains. He said, that's unscriptural. I've told them, I've told them to talk to the mountain. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. What does that mean, cancer? In Jesus' name, I curse you. Come out of me, I said. Are you listening? That's the first step. That's the first step. Cancer in Jesus' name, I curse you and I command you, obey me. I am talking to you, you dumb invader into my body. I'm talking to you and I command you. Cancer, I'm not asking you anything because you're an idiot anyway. I bind you and I command you, come out of me. You go from my body in Jesus' name, you're not, no cancer will ever kill me. And the louder you can say it, and the stronger you can say it, the better God likes it. In fact, if you'd sit several hundred times a day real strong, no telling what he'd do. He'd probably go, Woo! Glory to God, look at her. Listen to her. See, every time, you, every time you talk to a mountain in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, it boils up into the throne of God. But when you pray in Jesus' name, heaven starts hearing you. You just have to know that. There is no name that you can pray with <laughs> except the name of Jesus. You don't have any name you have a right to pray with and claim things except the name of Jesus. You haven't been given any other name where you've even promised eternal life or healing or anything else except the name of Jesus. Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Jesus said, all things you ask God for when you pray, he'll give them to you. Only believe and he'll give them to you. Okay, Jesus, I'll read it. Got to keep my place here. I tell you, these side roads are just as good as the main highway. Turn with me to Matthew 21, 22. You need to see what Jesus says for yourself. You need to see it. You know, the Holy Ghost can remind you of scriptures that will set you free. I tell you, the Holy Ghost will feed you if you let him. Glory be to God forever. Everybody that's saved, hold up your hand. Well, if you're saved, then you ought to believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe what he says? Amen. All right, look what he says. It's him talking to you in Matthew 21, 22. Jesus says, now this is, this is all for all you tough cases. You know that you, you know, have tough cases. Well, God don't have any tough cases. I am telling you boldly tonight in Jesus' name that he can melt cancer at the bat of an eye. You don't have anything. He can do away with that dumb thing so fast it make your head swim. I mean, remove it from you completely. And I don't care what it is. I don't care if you have knots and gross all over you, if you have balls all over you. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. God give her two lungs to fast to make her head swim. Two new lungs. But you have to say that. If you want two new lungs, you have to ask for it. Two new lungs, Jesus! Two new lungs, they're mine. I claim them in Jesus' name. Two new lungs. You have to say two new lungs loud and strong. Not just pray and see what's going to happen. You don't see what's going to happen. You claim it for yourself and thank God for it. God makes lungs all the time and he'll make them for you. Or anything else that you need. You just have to know that. He'll make them for you anything else you need. Jesus said, in all things. Is that what, 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 what? And all things. The first three words. Look there. And all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. All things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. But you don't believe. It says believing, but you don't believe unless you talk like you got it and act like you got it before you ever get it. Faith is not seen, my brother and sister. You have to talk like you got it. He just go around the country saying, well, have faith in this and have faith in that and have faith in this and have faith in that. Well, that's not good enough for us to teach that kind of stuff. 
faith in this and faith in that. That's not good enough. Kenneth Hagin called me when I was over in Honolulu in January and he says, Norval, we've decided that we want you to come to our camp meeting in July in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we want to give you the 1030 service every morning, every morning. And we want you to teach on the subject of faith. Faith. You know, so many people are mi so mixed up and confused about it, they don't even know how, how it works. It's the most important ingredient in the Bible that you can have is faith. Yes. Your faith in God. But you, you, you can't believe unless you talk like you've got it and act like you've got it. Talk like you've got it and act like you've got it. And then, while you're talking like you've got it, and claiming you've got it, talking like you've got it, act like you've got it because it's been given to you, all that time, then you have to stop and talk to the devil. Talk to the mountain. And say no to it and resist it. Every time you say no to anything the devil's trying to do to you and resist it. No, I won't receive cancer. Cancer in Jesus' name, I resist you and I command you obey me. I'm talking to you, cancer. I command you. You leave my body. You'll never kill me. I stop you dead in your tracks in Jesus' name. I said, stop. You leave me. Disappear in Jesus' name. Cancer, you can't stay in me, you dumb jerk. I'm talking to you. In Jesus' name, I'm talking to you. You have to obey me. I said, die. And you have to talk just like that. If you don't, it won't die. You can't go around saying, cancer, I wish you would leave me alone. I don't like you. You're trying to mess me up. I don't like you. I wish you'd leave me alone. But the devil don't like nothing God does. You know what? The devil don't want you talking to cancer. Why? Because Jesus said for you to. He don't want you talking to cancer. Because Jesus said for you to. Anything that Jesus told you to do, the, de uh, the devil don't want that. No, he don't want that. That's the reason, if you ever leave the doctrine of faith, in the latter times, the Spirit says, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And if you ever leave the doctrine of confession, all powers in Jesus' name, if you ever leave the doctrine of talking to mountains, obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, and you start just being a nice Christian. Kind of, you know, just kind of like a daisy. Well, I went somewhere and they prayed for me. My church loves me and they got my name on the blackboard and pray for the sick. <laughs> and they're, they're praying for me, you know. I go to a good church, you know, and, and my church loves me and they're praying for me. Well, I mean, I don't doubt that part, but... Uh, I said, uh, do you talk to the cancer? What? <laughs> no. Uh, have they, has the cancer been cursed in Jesus' name? And, and, and has somebody commanded it to stop? Dead in its tracks right now? Now faith is. Not next month. Amen. Now. Uh, no. No. Nobody ever prayed like that. But, you know, my church is praying for me. I said, well, you know, you have a problem. What? I said, you and your church both is dead. <laughs> I said, your mind is dead. Your knowledge of Jesus the healer is dead. And God only works through knowledge. And you don't have any knowledge of what Jesus said to you. You don't have any knowledge of Jesus the healer. You don't have any. And you better get some knowledge of Jesus the healer because if you don't, cancer will kill you. I can prove it to you by thousands and hundreds of thousands of families that's lost people with cancer. Cancer will kill you. And you're no exception, honey. You know, I just, I'm so glad you're here because you come to the right place. But if you don't accept the truth, you'll die too. I mean, you know, the gospel don't play any guessing games. There's no guessing games in Jesus. You either accept him or you don't. You either live or you die. There's no in-between. You either believe or you don't believe.
You either talk to mountains or you don't talk to them. You either go to a church that can get you healed or you don't go to one. There's no in-between. For every human being, it's either life or death. It's either the devil or God. There's no in-between. It's either the truth or false. Make up your mind, God said, who you're going to believe today. Make up your mind. Jesus said, if you listen to me, and God said, if you listen to my son, you can have anything you want. The abundant life totally has been prepared for you. The abundant life. Only one kind of life has been prepared for you. It's called the abundant life. What does that mean? Honey, that means, that means the palace in London, England, uh, where they, you know, the royal family lives. Uh, it's like trash. I can tell you right now, when you start praying for an hour of a morning, <laughs> and you start believing the Bible yourself, and start talking to mountains and quoting the Bible yourself, only then, get this straight, only then, do you ever enter into the royal life. You have the royal life of God flowing through your veins. You have the royal life throwing, flowing through your hands, flowing through your feet, flowing through your legs, flowing through your mouth, flowing through your tongue. The royal life, my brother and sister. You'd be surprised at the Christians that tries to live a Christian life and they have a confused, beaten down life. They don't have, they're not living a royal life. There's only been one kind of life provided for you and it's called the abundant life. That means the abundance that God has is yours. All the abundance that God Almighty has in all the storehouses in heaven, they are yours, my brother and sister. Jesus is not a liar. He says, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. You ought to try that some morning at 5 o'clock. Get into some of these prayer meetings. Well, I don't never ask the Lord for nothing but the novel. I never ask the Lord to save my neighbors. And I never ask the Lord to save people in the south and north and east and west. And I don't never really ask the Lord to bless the missionaries. And I don't, I don't never ask the Lord to save my relatives, you know, and call them by name and confess they'll never go to hell. I, I just kind of come to church, you know, and, and give a little bit of money to the church. And you know, Brother Novel, and just do the best I can. That's not the best you can. Amen. The best you can is get up, push your shoulders back, get dressed, come down and join your fellow workers, start praying unto God, walk in the floor and praying unto God, and the royal life of God will flow through you like a river. Brother, I'm telling you, you, you start reading the Bible, and it looks better than a Hershey bar with nuts. Glory to God forever. <laughs> oh, really? Well, the Bible, when I read the Bible, Brother Norman, it's just a book, you know, it's just a book. No, it's not just a book. There's life. The words are anointed. There's love in these words. Makes you want to eat it sometime. <laughs> they jumped out at you. Feeds you, gives you food, heaven food. Glory to God forever. Blessed be the name of Jesus. If you ever fall in love with the Bible, you got it made. See? Some people don't want to read, you know. Fall in love with the Bible. Say, oh, God, these words. I have sent my word to you. The Bible says I have sent my word to you to heal you, God says. Sent my word to you to heal you. Did you know that God is medicine? All, any person, I don't care if it's the lady that got cancer or anybody else. Now listen closely. Because I'm going right down the channel and out of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God forever. I like it that way though. All anybody has to do is for any kind of affliction or any kind of disease. All you have to do is make that affliction. Don't ask it nothing. You make that affliction. Eat Matthew for breakfast. Hallelujah. Mark for lunch and Luke for dinner at night, and John for a midnight snack. Yeah. Feed him. Well, 
want cancer? You think you're so smart? You think you're going to live in me forever and kill me and take my life? I got news for you, you dumb jerk. I am going. I'm going to make you have a good breakfast this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to feed you five chapters in the book of Matthew. And read them out loud so you'll believe it yourself. <laughs> Feed it. If once in a while stop, say, Cancer, hey, when you come to healing verse, quote it about ten times and say, Hey, dummy, how you like that? <laughs> Eat it. Eat it. I command you. <laughs> I command you, Cancer, chew that up and swallow it. Because this is mine, it's 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 mine. And I'm going to eat it every morning the rest of my life. And you try to hang on to my body, you dummy, you're going to eat it too. I'm going to feed it to you, I'm going to feed it to you. And I'm telling you right now, if you will put the gospel pressure on cancer, after a while, it can just take so much. And after a while, it'll go, ow, and run off. Just run off. <laughs> I've sent my word to heal you, God said. The word of God is like good medicine to you. Medicine. Everybody say medicine. Yes. Hey, I'm telling you the Bible is medicine to you. Medicine. And then another good medicine to keep your heart and mind in good shape is when you're alive. Joy of the Lord is your strength. Feed that disease chapters in the New Testament, and then life at the devil. Confess it's true and it's yours, and you're so glad that the Bible is true, and you're so happy that you can read, and you're so happy that it's yours, it's yours, it's mine, I got it, I got it, I got it, these healing verses are mine, I got it, I got it, I got it, and then just life because you're so happy that you got it, and just life and life and life, life and life and life and life. All crooked legs that people speak to and talk to and laugh at, they all straighten out. Amen. Oh, they do? Oh, every one of them. Well, I, never, I don't ever hear anybody doing that. That's the reason they're crooked. I got news for you. And they're going to stay crooked until they start obeying the God's Word or find somebody that has anointing on them that can pray for you, and sometimes God's power, whoosh, if you'll be at the right spot at the right time, sometimes God's power will go through you under anointing. But when you leave the building, and uh, a few days later, and a few weeks later, and a few months later, uh, you're going to have to get into God's Word and start confessing it, because the final analysis is going to be your faith, your faith in God. The final analysis of anything is always the person's faith in God, because if he don't, it'll come back up on you. This one woman said, said, Bob, she come to service, she said, I want to ask you a question. Now, I used to work with Catherine Kuhlman some. Precious woman of the Lord. She said, you know, I went to Catherine Kuhlman's service and just sitting out there in the congregation. Uh, I, the Lord healed me. I said, the Lord has healed thousands of people sitting in services of Catherine Kuhlman just sitting in the congregation. She didn't pray for you before you got healed. I said, her whole ministry was built on two gifts, the gifts of healing and the gift of word of knowledge. Her whole ministry was built on that. And I said, she protected it. That's the reason it works so strong, because she protected it. She wouldn't let you come up until after you got healed. But the Lord would heal hundreds. She said, well, I got my healing totally. I mean, the Lord healed me completely, completely healed me. And I stayed completely healed for two years. I mean completely. Not one symptom of any kind for two years. But can you tell me why it's come back up on me now and I'm worse than I ever was? Why, sure. Sure it's come up on you. You said that right. Because you didn't go around and pass out tracks. You didn't tell people that Jesus healed you. You're overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. 
You didn't memorize enough healing verses. You didn't feed your own body and feed your faith and feed your spirit and feed your mind that you could think straight. Healing verses. Get consumed, get possessed with Jesus the healer if you want to stay healed. All the scriptures you deal with nonchalantly won't even work for you. They just, a little touch here and there, a little touch here and there. Uh, get a foundation in God. Be steadfast, unmovable. The Lord's not going to change. He's not going to change. He'll do for you what you believe Him for. And He'll do it any time that your faith passes His test. Or sometimes He will do it when you don't have much faith, if it's under anointing that's on somebody else at the right place at the right time. That's the reason I encourage you to come to these meetings if you need help. And encourage you to bring your friends if they need help. Come to the right place at the right time. Pray and get you started on the right road. You got to get on the right road, my brother and sister. You got to get on the right road. You understand that? On the right road. A man asked me one time, Bob, a man, a Pentecostal leader, Bob, he asked me one time, he said, I want to ask you a question. I mean, I'm holding a question and answer session. He rose up and he says, I want to ask you a question, Mr. Hayes. I was in Pennsylvania and he says, I know you speak up in here some, you know, and the thing he says, and we, uh, you know, come to hear you speak and you come up in here, but I want to ask you a question. He says, I'm a good Christian. I go to a full gospel church. And he says, I go to a full gospel church. And then he said, I, uh, we, we, me and my wife is good standing in the church, good standing in the church. And we have a, a side ministry working with dope addicts downtown under our pastor's approval. We're not rebels. Get this straight. You ever leave a good, solid church because that God has come and visited you some in a prayer meeting or because you prayed for four or five people and they received healing, and you've got it in your idea that you're one of the top evangelists, that God's given you the spirit of Paul. <laughs> and God's going to want you to go out and start a church, and you go out, just step out, not having the church and the pastor's approval on what you're doing, you're walking on dangerous ground. If God's called you to do something, come before the elders of the church and explain it to them. And see if seasoned men of God agree with what you're saying. You understand that? See if seasoned men of God agree with what you're saying. I usually do my counseling as far as myself is concerned in my ministry. For a number of years, I usually do my counseling with John Osteen and Kenneth Haggard and Lester Summerall. I think they've proved themselves pretty well, as much as anybody else has. I don't know of anybody that's any stronger than they are. I'm talking about day by day, by day by day, by day by day.